Uh, yeah, again, just to start out, why don't we just kind of go through everybody, just tell us a little bit about what you, what you work on at your uh, respective companies. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie. I'm the lead product manager at Yik Yak. Yik Yak's mission is to make the world feel small again. You don't, it's a social network where you don't have to worry about building up your friend list. Um, the moment you sign on, you can t immediately talk to people who are around you. And so I build their infrastructure to run growth experiments like A-B testing, push notifications. I implemented our analytics, such as Amplitude. I instrumented every single one of our events, and I run kind of the strategy and process for running experiments across the company. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Spencer, CEO and co-founder of uh, Amplitude. I started the company three and a half years ago when I saw what was going on uh, with the best growth teams and the sort of analytics they were doing in-house at companies like Facebook or Uber or Airbnb. Uh, and I felt that what was out there in the market was not even close uh, to what these top internal teams were doing. Uh, and so I wanted to get better, uh, get better products out there from an analytics perspective and really help people understand and improve their retention. Uh, so you know, we have uh, hundreds of customers today, uh, including the, the folks at Yik Yak. Uh, my name is Adam. I run marketing and partnerships at Wiseline. Uh, we're the ones outside with the cookies, uh, probably is the best way to describe us. Um, no, we're, we're an intelligent uh, uh, product road mapping and planning uh, software built for product teams and their stakeholders. And really our vision is to, to make uh, product planning and prioritization more data-driven, more transparent, more effective. Um, so happy to chat with anybody after, uh, after the event. Um, Prior to, to WiseLine, I worked at a company called Uyala. I was a product manager there where I was uh, working on video monetization uh, offerings. Um, so I can try to put my product hat on or my marketer hat on, um, but also the B2B hat. So cool, really great. To be here. Awesome. Uh, Eric, and I'm still at Yelp. Um, so <laughs> I guess start out, you know, I feel like retention has come up a lot in the last uh, half hour or so. So maybe let's start there. Um, Maybe either, as I know we all kind of work in slightly different spaces, maybe talk a little bit about either how you've tried to move retention or how you've measured retention or any kind of challenges you face around that. I think we all, I think one thing we've seen that's clear is that's, that's kind of, that's the metric or that's a, a very, very important metric that I think actually sometimes gets overlooked, especially when people are really focused on acquisition. So um, yeah, why don't we start with you? Sure. So at Yik Yak, we're kind of blessed in that Acquisition is not our top concern. Our brand awareness is very strong. Once people find out about Yik Yak, they tend to tell all their friends about it. And so retention is actually something that we've been philosophically and like just, just uh, needs of the business focused on the most. And so for us, one of the most important things to learn about was the difference between kind of the short-term retention, which I think uh, we'll uh, refer to as activation, versus kind of long-term retention. Because you run very different tests, you build very different feature sets, depending on which segment of that retention cycle that you're targeting. So uh, short-term retention is just, does anyone find any value in your app enough to return at least one more time? Long-term retention is, uh, do people continue to build up habit and continue to have reasons to return? And is your app something more than just a passing amusement? Does it bring actual value? And so Yik Yak, we tackle both of them. Uh, in the first week, it's just about showing them really, really engaging, high quality content. And then long term, like we have to stay relevant to the community. Maybe after freshmen and sophomores have used Yik Yak for a while, they might think the content is stale, in which case we need to surface even cooler content from elsewhere or introduce like topical content like debates uh, and live chats around the ongoing like um, presidential primary debates, for instance. Cool, great. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about retention is what you said is that, you know, if you look at a lot of people kind of think that their biggest concern should be top of funnel, but if you actually look at the differences between the top apps in the app store and everyone else, it's not that they have more top of funnel, that it's actually that their retention curves are like much higher. So it's something like, you know, retention curve for like the top 10 apps will look like that. And then, you know, one for the top 100 apps will look like that. And, you know, if you get out to the thousands, you're like all the way down there. Um, so I think, you know, it's, de it's definitely, you know, I was on a retention panel um, where we were talking about something similar a few weeks ago. And the first question out of the audience was something about acquisition top of funnel. And I just wanted to be like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, this is not what you want to focus your business on. Um, I think uh, kind of elaborating on what Julie said about retention, it, it's important to break it up into different components. The way we normally recommend 
uh, our customers to look at it is a new user retention. So that's kind of the activation is someone coming back a day or two later, uh, returning user uh, uh, retention. So for your current user base, are they continuing to engage? And then resurrected users. So people who come back to your app after being dormant for a long time, uh, you know, what is there? Because they're all, those sort of experiences are really different. If you're a resurrected user, if you're someone who's coming back to the application after not uh, using it for a while, you're like, you know, you come back and like the, the sorts of the mindset that you're in and what you're trying to do is very, very different than if you're someone who's coming back every day or every week. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of like the first slice we recommend uh, people to take a look at. Cool. Great. Um, yeah, I'll talk a real quick about, about Yelp. One of the things we've learned is that we've got different um, kind of user types. Some people are coming to Yelp, you know, a few times a week. Maybe they're just going out more. Some people are coming to Yelp, you know, once a month. Maybe they just, you know, they, they only have need need once a month. So it's, it's, we have to slice retention in sort of different ways. You look at yeah. kind of seven day, it's like, well, actually, there's an audience for Yelp. They come back, you know, maybe once, maybe twice a month. We're actually yep. okay with that. You know, we'd love to move them up. But um, it was important for us to kind of segment by, hey, we've got these really active users. We have these less active users, but we don't need to necessarily need to focus on retaining them as much. We just need to focus on getting them kind of keep doing what they were doing, but in a different bucket from this other audience. So we've kind of learned that there's kind of these nuances to retention. Yeah, the, the experience is definitely very different for those people. Like what they're coming to do is That's like right. you, know, you have your hardcore reviewers who are like, oh, you know, there is a fly in my food or whatever. And totally. The, uh, and retaining the new users too, right? That's a whole different ball game, right? People exactly. just game them to come back. Like one to two is actually like a really important group to focus on, and then it's kind of two plus. Uh, after that. Yeah, so I might be a little bit unique in this crowd in that I'm at a B2B company, but just anybody out there working B2B, it's a little bit different from B2C, so. Yeah, okay, lots, awesome, right. like good, good representation. Um, so we are, we're definitely a mobile also um, company. We focus first on the web app. Um, I do think we're, we're really strong believers in <clears throat> kind of the consumerization of B2B. Um, you know, if you, if you go in and create an account and you see, you see the software, we're trying to create something that's seamless and, and intuitive and um, we're really trying to empathize with those business users. I think it's, it's only fair. Um, you know, we spend so much time in some of these B2B apps that like, it's, it's about time that they, that they actually treat us like users. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, it's, it's interesting because what, there, in terms of the platform, there are you know, the main web app users who are typically product managers who are creating roadmaps, uh, capturing input, capturing requirements, getting product ideas. Uh, and then there are kind of their stakeholders, right, who are viewing the roadmap or submitting ideas, submitting requests. And so what we, we've kind of uncovered, which is really unique, is that um, the requesters are much more likely to submit information via, uh, via mobile. And so we have a mobile survey that you're able to send out. And it's a really unique ca use case in that. Um, I think we, we did a, a couple studies uh, a couple months ago, and within 24 hours, people on mobile were three times more likely to actually submit the survey, right? And that's really important for us because that additional information in the platform makes it a much richer and a much more comprehensive view of, you know, how many times has this feature been requested or how, much, how many times has this idea come up before? And so we're, we're kind of reinvesting in, in mobile and looking at how, how we can kind of bifurcate our users and use, um, you know, less full uh, evaluators and, and ideas and or people who are submitting ideas on mobile to drive higher engagement and retention on the, the web app. Um, so that, that kind of metric is something that we're, we're looking into very, uh, very actively. Um, we're trying to quantify how much additional engagement we get on the web app side, and that's something that we're, we're working on. And so if you guys have any ideas, I would love to chat with you after. Cool. So yeah, so, so retention, obviously a really, a really key metric, I think, for most of us. So maybe let's talk a little bit about um, some metrics that can be misleading, right? So, so maybe let's, let, let's help the audience and people out there avoid some mistakes. You know, what's, what, what's a metric that, and from your experience, um, you know, Spencer, you mentioned maybe yeah. user acquisition, maybe not a misleading metric, but maybe not the first metric people yeah. should focus on. But yeah, what's some data or, or, or metric you found that one can of the, people astray? W one of the biggest things is look like the, 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 the talk uh, right before this alluded to this, but you, the key is to figure out what is the usage pattern that makes sense for your application. So a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, platforms have look at like daily user retention. So how many people are coming back on exactly day one, day two, day, you know, day seven, day 30. Um, and depending on your product, that actually does, might not make sense. If you're a game, yeah, yeah, it's very important to come back every single day because the first day you miss, you're likely to be gone. Um, but if you're something like Yelp, you know, like you said, 
or uh, you know, food delivery app or something, like, your usage is not like, you're looking at more like a once a week or even once a month cadence. Uh, and so understanding like, hey, you know, looking at retention in a daily bucket is not appropriate if I'm an app that has a different usage pattern uh, than daily. Right. Um, that's kind of, that's like the first thing that, that I think people get wrong. Because then they're like, oh, well, only 2% of people are coming back on day 30. Well, you know, if you're a delivery app, that might not be too bad. But if you're a game, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I could jump in here as well to, to Spencer's point. So there is, there's kind of a cadence to planning uh, within our, our application. Um, and what's normal for one team might be totally abnormal for another. Some people are doing two-week sprints. Some people are doing big quarterly planning. Some people are even doing, you know, longer planning than that. And so it took us a while. We would freak out because we would, you know, we'd see this new account and be like, this is a great logo. You know, they're using the account. And engagement would just tail off, and we would we'd freak out and be like, what's going on? But it just happened that that was kind of the, the, the engagement pattern that was natural to their workflow. Uh, so I think having context into, you know, what is, what are your users, what are the jobs that they're looking to do with your app and make sure that, that you're measuring accordingly. This was the you yeah. guys expect I, every I day. Used, yeah, totally. I used to work for a travel site called Hipmunk, and we would look at month over month, even year over year retention versus at Yik Yak, it's like every day, every week. It's a very, very different type of app and therefore very different retention goals. Yeah, if you're, if you're like social or messenger or gaming, then it's like you, you want to do that every day, but for a lot of other stuff, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, 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 that totally makes sense. So you know, a couple of examples from, from Yelp that we've, that we've learned is, one is um, it, it's easy often to look at kind of mid-funnel metrics, right? So I think one, one obvious example is email. So you're trying to optimize for, say, open rate in your email. But I think most of the time, you actually don't really care how many people just open the email. You care about what they did after they landed yeah. on the destination. So you can all day long increase your open rate, but if you're not doing something after people open the email, you're probably not actually getting where you want to be. So it's making sure you're measuring the ultimate outcome as opposed to sort of the midpoint. Um, so, so that was, I think that was, that was one kind of uh, key learning. Um, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, I was just going to say, you know, the, I love the metric from Will's presentation um, that showed there was an inter interstitial or, or some additional click, but it provided additional information about the app, and it actually increased downloads and activations, which I think, at the marketer in me is like, anytime you add a click, you're going to have tail off, right? And so I think, again, knowing the context and being able to test and measure, um, because I, I love the idea of adding an additional step, but actually increasing uh, the, the metric and the goal that you're trying to drive. Right. Yeah, one thing kind of related we found is that often, too, there's, there's metrics that go together. So these these pairs of metrics. The one example in our app is we've been trying to drive signups up. But if you work hard at driving signups up, you often increase bounce rate because maybe you're being more aggressive at pitching signups. So you have these pairs of things, and you've got to measure those together. As one goes up, the other one tends to go down. And trying to figure out the right, the right balance there can be important, too. And figure out how much you care. Like, maybe you actually don't care that bounce rate goes up and if you, if you get that sign up. So just knowing what those trade-offs are between two key metrics becomes important. Um, cool. Well, so you know, moving on to something else. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, instrumentation, which may, might sound boring, but I don't think it is boring because it's also really important because, you know, you think you, we're talking about analytics. If you set up your analy analytics poorly, you're, you're kind of hosed, right? You don't actually have the right data to measure in the first place. So um, maybe we'll start with you, Spencer, because I know, you know, you've, you've worked with a lot of customers and you've probably seen how they've set up their analytics Yep. Systems. What are, what are some kind of common mistakes you've seen, or maybe also some kind of best practices when it comes the, to the instrumentation? The biggest, I think, one of the things we do in the onboarding process for every single customer of ours is we have them go through an event taxonomy review where they explicitly outline what are we tracking and how is that labeled within the analytics product. Uh, and the reason we do that is because you know if you know at first we didn't, we just had people kind of set it up on their own. Uh, and you know the sorts of ways people would you know expect to view the metrics in the dashboard. It's like oh well, you can't exactly track it using the system in this way. Um, so like if there's one recommendation that I have, it's absolutely doing that because it gets multiple people uh, on your team on the same page. Because the people doing the instrumentation are different from the people running the analytics surfaces, are different from the actual people doing the analysis and with the questions at the end of the day, and like. The, the problem is you, you need coordination between all those groups of people. Um, and so having like a central place where you're like, all right, here is, here is what this event means. Here's what this name means. Here is uh, you know, where, what is actually happening when you know, this, this event is showing up. Uh, that's kind of that's the, the most important uh, to piece to, to getting successful instrumentation. Because if you don't do that, it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. You're not right. tracking anything right. successful. 
Cool. Do anything you've learned on this one? Yeah, I was involved in instrumenting every single event that we track. And the more that I work on this, the more I realize just how important it is to literally instrument everything, like things yeah. you don't think you need to. So in one example, we launched a new feature, and the feature had like a three-page tutorial that we thought was pretty important because it was like somewhat difficult to understand. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to instrument the moment when someone enters the tutorial and the moment when they finish. And so I gave those, those instructions to the engineers, and um, iOS ran with what I said. Android was a little more uh, 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 taking initiative and basically instrumented every single page without telling me. And so when we, when we launched and I started looking at the numbers, we saw a big drop-off between people entering the tutorial and people finishing. But on iOS, I couldn't tell where they were dropping off. And on Android, I knew exactly where it was. It was like between page one and two, not two and three. And so if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have known. And so that was my lesson. And now I instrument absolutely everything. Cool. Yeah, I found too, there's just this is an important step here for, for a product manager or whomever. Instrumentation often just gets just missed or the very basics get implemented. And even simple things like, hey, just test end to end to make sure what's being instrumented is actually giving you the output that, that you expect. I think people often kind of instrument just the very, very basics. And also, like you said, we, we know we've got a data science team making sure that data scientists are involved in that instrumentation process. So they're helping define what results they're ultimately going to get. Right. That, that, that's, I think, once you do that, I think you're, you're getting you, like you know, it's, it's, an, it's, it's hard to do. When I, when I think what analytics is going to be like 20 years from now, this is all going to be handled automatically. Um, we're kind of in the stone age of, of analytics development right now. So, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, excuse me. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Wow. You're so excited. No, yeah, I know. I just, I'm so excited about instrumentation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, I, I do think, you know, one of the important things that we've learned is, you know, we'll do a big push and make sure everything is instrumented and everything's in the app and then, you know, six months later we'll do a release and, like, it's probably the last thing that the engineering team actually wants to do. Like, they're like, yeah, we built new functionality, like, let's ship, let's get it out. And then it's like, oh yeah, you gotta go in and add all this additional code, right? So I think what we try to do is it's incumbent on both the, the marketing and product team to share the insights that we're able to drive so that they have the business context and they understand, oh, this is something I will invest in because I get why it's an important thing to do. It's not just like another list of things that I have to do at the end of this sprint, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's been really critical for us. Cool. So, you know, okay, so we've, we've done great instrumentation. We've got all of this data, you know, thanks to people like Spencer and other folks. So now what do you do with this data, right? Because I think there's, there's, we're, we're kind of drowning in data now. And how, how do you help people? Or what, are, what are some of your all experiences in making that data actionable and turning it into product decisions or, you know, further experimentations, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, well, the first thing after you've instrumented everything and you're collecting your data is to learn more about your users, segment them, uh, break them up into cohorts. I think um, someone up here earlier said averages mean nothing. It's all about looking at segments of users, cohorts of users, and figuring out what it is that people do in their first day, in their first week that kind of gets them to the magic moment. Like Facebook kind of coined the term, it was like 10 friends in seven days or so, which, by the way, uh, uh, isn't actually based on real math. Like, they could have chosen <laughs> nine friends in seven days, 11 friends in seven days. It wouldn't have mattered. But, in, in, but the point was that you have to build up your social network in order to get any value from the app. So for us at Yik Yak, um, it's not really you have to compose a yak in order to be seen, at, in order to derive value from it. There's a lot of good, great content on the app, and a lot of people are very happy to be lurkers. But if you don't click on any yak, or if you don't vote on anything, that's really bad, because you found nothing of value, and therefore, we're in big danger of losing you. The one thing you can do is make sure you segment your data to make sure it's to find a group that on which you could take some sort of action instead of sort of looking at yeah, this Yeah, define gigantic, like gigantic what the tool. happiest path is. Like who are the users that come in, do exactly what you want and end up as your super engaged users and figure out how they got there and try and emulate that experience for, to as many other users as yeah, possible. The, the key is like you, you want to look at, at the end of the day, it's like, all right, you have some group of users that are retained and are successful and you have a group of users that have churned. And what's the difference between the group of users that are retained and successful and the group of users that have churned? And that can be any sort, a lot of sort of segments that you're talking about, Julie. Um, it can be people who do different behaviors. It can be different acquisition channels. It can be you know, different countries or different devices. Um, but that's like the idea is that you're trying to pick out what is the difference between those two groups. 
um, because that will tell you, oh, this is what I need to focus on on the product side. These users are good and these users are bad. Right. Yeah, I think one thing we found too is just the simple thing of setting up a process, you know, so if for every, especially as we're doing more and more experimentation, you know, if we're, do, we're doing 50 plus experiments a week, so just, hey, there's an instrumentation step, there's an execution step, and then there's an analysis step, and there's a decision step, but just making sure there's kind of a checklist around those things, like what was happening to us for a period is that analysis would get backed up, and then decision making would get backed up, and often the decisions are actually quite hard, it's usually, often not just like, oh, this is good or bad, it's like, ah. Uh, we're kind of making some sort of trade-off. So just making sure you've got like a checklist that says, that kind of forces a decision. One, one nice thing that I've seen is what you want to do is have people come up with hypotheses. Like mm. have them commit, because a lot of times what will happen is you look at the data and you'll say, well, obviously these users are better. Or well, obviously someone who, you know, is composing Yaks is better retained. Or well, obviously someone on our iOS app is better. Um, what you want to do is come up hy with hypotheses and then then look at the data to challenge those. It's like, okay, does this lead to better retention or worse retention? Um, because then you'll have kind of like that clear framework in your head. One, one, of the, one of the things that always frustrates me is, you know, you talk about that Facebook, you know, you talk about that Facebook study, Julie, and whenever people talk about it, you know, the reaction is, oh, well, that's so obvious. Of course you have to build your social network. But it, it wasn't to them at the time. You know, I think one of the failures that MySpace had was MySpace made the focus not building the social network, but it was building out your page, and here's my page, and here's my you know, identity, and here's this cool thing. And that's where Facebook started, too. That exactly, was exactly. Hypothesis. Yeah, it was about like, oh, let's build out my, fill out my profile. But when they actually looked at the data, it was like, hey, profile completion doesn't correlate that well to retention. You know what correlates? Well, adding friends. Uh, and that's what transformed them into the social app and, you know, the, this massively successful, you know, according to their uh, for, former head of product, uh, Chamath, that was the single biggest insight. So I think the key part of that is, you know, write down your hypotheses ahead of time. Say, here is what I want to understand. Uh, because then you'll say, okay, this surprised me or this didn't surprise me. Cool. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, the data and obviously it's important to analyze data. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about experiences where kind of the limits of data, right? Like what are, what are cases where you felt like either we don't need to measure this, or you know, even if it doesn't move a metric, we're okay with that. Is there some area of product that you could kind of carve out to say, yeah, it's, o it's okay to be less quantitative there? Yeah, yeah I could jump in and, and say a couple things here. You know, I, Spencer, I really like your point about hy hypotheses. I mean, I think often it's a pitfall to fall into a decision mode where like, you're searching for a golden metric, right? It's like, if we just found this number and we knew it went up 200% and this, goal that we're trying to achieve would go up 500%, that would be like perfect. Um, that can kind of be paralyzing. And I think starting from act, trying to act, you know, figure out what you're trying to disprove first is, is a great step. Um, I think, you know, Audrey's talk earlier today from Thumbtack, I, I loved how she, again, um, you know, was talking about getting, actually getting in front of your users and actually being there, right? So I think um, I would add, you know, be your own power user is kind of a, a um, a best practice because sometimes we, you know, we reach for the data because we're analytical and we want to just get in the numbers and get dirty and like look at the numbers when you could probably answer some of these questions just by like downloading the app and doing your onboarding every single day. Yeah, right. And so I think um, it's finding the right tool to write the, answer the right question as fast as possible, right? Because you know, we are trying to grow and, and build businesses here and, and time is money and, and the, shor the shortest the distance you can get that uh, the better. Right? Qualitative data, like just talking, like literally talking, if honestly, like if you're focused on analytics and you haven't even talked to like 10 or 20 of your users, like I would rather you talk to 10 or 20 of your users than use analytics at the end of the day because that's not going to matter uh, for you at all. You know, analytics can tell you tons of things that talking to your users will, will not, but you know, the same is also true on the other side. Um, so you know, at least, at the very least, you know, you got to be starting there. Cool. Yeah, so I'd say two big areas where data really can't help you, where data reaches its limits. And one is exactly any sort of measure around quality. So we have communities at Yik Yak. It's used by over 2,000 college campuses, especially worldwide. And we can look at numbers around how many Yaks are posted, what the average vote score of things are. But what truly distinguishes a great and healthy community is something completely intangible. It comes with what's the content of what they're saying? Are they just resharing memes? Or are they having very in-depth, thoughtful conversations about 
their local issues, right? That's not something the data can tell you. It's something that you have to go and talk to the, the students who are actually using the app on the ground. So that's one. Yeah. Yeah, Jill, I was just going to oh, say yeah, that. Yeah. Go, go for it. Go for it. Oh, the, other one, the, the second, second area where data really can't help you is um, around user delight, user joy, things that you want to build into the app, not because it's going to move some metric, but it's going to delight users. So we have, when, when you want to get more fresh content, you pull down and there's a little refresher. And every once in a while, the art, the, our design team will just throw in a new um, design and we'll put really, really elaborate things in there, like for St. Patty's Day and for Chinese New Year and stuff. And we don't measure any of the numbers behind it because that would defeat the purpose of what the purpose of the refresher is, which is user delight. Yeah, Julie, I, I, just, I just wanted to echo that. And you, the, trying to quantify user delight is probably impossible. Um, and it's great that you, you have an appreciation for that kind of qualitative feedback. Uh, you know, People using a B2C app and getting really, really excited in the B2B world, that's, you know, people using our software in ways that we didn't know that it was, you know, we didn't intend it to be used this way, but you kind of look at it, you're like, that's actually really smart. And that's, that's really exciting because users start trying to use, at least in the B2B world, start using your software to solve ancillary or adjacent problems that they're having. And that's, that's again, it's kind of intangible and hard to quantify, but when you, when you know it, when you see it, you know it kind of mm -hmm. thing. One of, the, one of the funny things is our, our most used feature is not actually a retention report or a DAU report. It's actually looking at the individual history of a single user. So just mm -hmm. like qualitatively right. seeing, okay, what's, what's someone's experience? Actually, like that's the number one feature right. by usage. Um, so it's kind of crazy to, to think about that, you know, like you said, people using it in ways that you don't expect. It's powerful too, right? This feeling like you understand one person it feels more personal, it feels more real, I think, than when you're looking at a at a graph. Yeah, uh, so I think these are great. User research, user delight, hard things to quantify. I could, I could of course talk about emojis again here, but I won't because I don't want to get labeled emoji guy. So instead, <laughs> good place to wrap up. So thank you guys for the discussion. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much.